Today's date is June 9th, Sunday, June 9th, 2013. This is a panel on Marxism and the Theory of the Self. Uh, we're sponsored by Science and Society, the journal. Uh, we're the oldest Marxist journal uh, still around today. And we're, we have the editor, David Laidman, here with us, which is very nice. And his lovely wife, Marcia, is somewhere. Uh, oh, she can she, okay. Anyway, um, so we thank Science and Society. Hey, Brian. Hey, Shanae. We thank Science and Society for sponsoring this panel. And um, the panelists, my name is Russell Dale. Uh, I'll chair, but I'll also speak. Uh, the panelists are Jinro Zhang. Jinro is a, a PhD student um, from Peking University in Marxist philosophy. And Science and Society invited her to come and speak. And uh, she's doing very interesting work on notion of self and uh, in Marxist theory. Um, this is Justin Holt. Uh, Justin is uh, a professor of philosophy at Gallatin School at the NYU. And his forthcoming book, uh, should be out next year, is called The Social Thought of Karl Marx. Uh, so everybody should buy that next year when it comes out. Remember that? Plugging it for him. Um, but you also should subscribe to Science and Society, by the way. Um, I'm Russell Dale. I teach in Lehman and CUNY, CUNY and I teach at the Breck Forum, uh, which I hope you'll all come down to. I'm teaching a course that this year. I've been teaching Kant all year. This summer, I'm going to be doing Kant's uh, critique of uh, practical reason. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, critique of the power of judgment. We just did the critique of practical reason uh, at the Breck Forum. So it starts Friday at 5.30, so please, you're welcome to come. Anyway, so um, without further, and we have one more panelist, is Bill DeFazio. He's a professor of sociology at uh, St. John's University, and he also teaches at the Brecht Forum. He was teaching the Grundrisse and, and other works of Marx at the Brecht Forum. He's an exceptional professor, but he had this emergency, so he might not be able to make it. He called me this morning, and he's trying as hard as he can to get here. But we'll see. If he comes, that'd be great. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and you can hear uh, Bill DeFazio has a program called City Watch, which is on WBAI, uh, I think, every other or every third Saturday. Every Saturday? Every Saturday, yeah. City Watch is on every Saturday, but he's only the host every other week or every third week or something. So um, Bill DeFazio, City Watch, WBAI Radio 99.5 FM, or WBAI.org. You can always hear it streaming live on the web. Um, Saturday at 10. Saturday at 10. So um, without further ado, let's introduce or let's um, hear Jin Ro speak on the, the notion of self in Marx, Marxist philosophy. Okay, well, um, thank you, Russell, and thank you, everyone. Because uh, actually, I'm really nervous here because this is my first time doing this kind of thing. And uh, forgive me. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, forgive me for my poor English. Okay, so let me just read my paper. Uh, if you have any questions, we can discuss after. Okay. Um, my title is Self Within Relations in the Light of Marxist Philosophy. Um, after Stalin's tyranny, the Soviet Union's collapse, the 10 year disaster in China in the 1960s and the 1970s, called the uh, Cultural Revo Revolution, and the unique ongoing practice referred to in China as socialist theory with Chinese features, which is criticized because of, uh, because of its blatant capitalist features. A worldwide setback for communism seems to be shattering the socialist dream. People tend to believe that Marxism is stepping down from the stage of history and meanwhile equate Marxism with totalitarianism. The state and commands from the state. The Red Party is seen as always prior to the citizen. Individuals have neither rights nor freedom, and they are vanishing and under the control of other entity, an external one, operated by a group of pol uh, politicians and an, uh, a, or an arbitrary political party. However, as Derrida said, specters of Marx are wondering and reminding that those problems of capitalism that Marx has pointed out will never disappear. Crisis frequently attacks. Class polarization exacerbates. The ecosystem is collapsing. 
gender and racial discrimina discrimination <coughs> proliferate, and other problems that globalization brings about come to the fore one after another, all of which need us to find a balance between the society we live and ourselves. In the history of traditional German philosophy, Kant systematically raised and focused on self-consciousness and its philosophical foundations from the standpoint of a single isolated consciousness. For bourgeois uh, philosophizing, Kant marks a big breakthrough in the history of the study of cognition. Kant separated transcendental self-consciousness and the empirical self-consciousness, making transcendental self-consciousness the ground of empirical self-consciousness. Hegel then drew others into the development of self-consciousness and considered the process of knowing others as a necessary step of knowing self. That is, Hegel broke with the standpoint of a single, isolated consciousness. In Marx, self is social as in Hegel, and also obtains true historical meaning through its material foundations. Pure abstracted self, isolated from the process of production and from others, has no place in Marxist philosophy. However, the theory of self is often considered to be Marxist Marxism's Achilles heel. Despite of the fact that Marx did not develop a systematic theory of self, we can focus on what he says of self in his work. We will see that it is quite wrong to accuse Marx of disdaining individuals. Marx claims precisely in the German ideology, the first premise of all human history is, of course, the existence of living human individuals. However, for Marx, a living self is never a pure isolated uni unit or an, I or an individual who can be abstracted out of or so, uh, social context as a calculable uh, atom. There is no absolute individual. Self exists only within relations. We will see Marx explicitly saying this in a moment in his thesis on Feuerbach. When discussing the development of self or self-consciousness, we cannot ignore social relations. That is to say, we have to put the individual back into a larger context. The larger context is both social and historical. Through a dialectical process of abstraction, we are able to grasp self at different levels of generality, at the social level or at the historical level and we are able to put things back together again and see the perspective of the whole. In this essay, I will argue that real social and historical individuals are precisely the starting point of historical materialism and cannot be separated from Marx's theory of production. Marx's historical dialectics is always focused on uh, three sets of relations. Self and the labor, self and others, and self and the state. Although these three sets of relations are twisted together in the reality, it is necessary to proceed step by step, looking at each abstractly so we can figure out how Marx is found self within these relations. Let's look at each of these pairs of relations. Uh, one, self and the labor, or actualizing the self through labor. For Marx, human being has three main meanings that every individual shares. First, a human being is a conscious being. Second, a human being is a social being. In the thesis of Feuerbach, Marx has a famous and a crucial claim. Quote, the human essence is no abstraction inherently in each single individual. In its reality, it is the ensemble of the social relations, end quote. Third, a human being is a practical being. Again, in thesis on Feuerbach, Marx says, quote, the chief defect of all hitherto existing materialism is that the thing, reality, sensuousness, is conceived only in the form of the object or of contemplation, but not as sensuous human activity, practice, end quote. Here, practice means undertaking real productive activities, that is, labor. By producing the means of subsistence, people are in indirectly producing their actual material life. Therefore, labor is the forefront and a necessary bridge that links people to nature as well as to the society. 
Labor has a historical content. The meaning of labor varies over time. When labor is a mere tool for bare survival, sold as a commodity, as in capitalism, it is separated and alienated from people themselves. Marx ex uh, elucidated the relationship between self and labor through this concept of alienated la labor. In an alienated society, like a capitalist society, workers and their labor power become commodities. The more they produce, the cheaper they themselves become. Also, workers cannot afford with their small wages what, uh, what they create, what should be theirs in the first place. Through the process of labor, the worker solidifies her or himself into an object or objectifies themselves. For Marx, a product is never merely a thing, but a bundle of relations. Firstly, a product is really a relationship between a worker and the product itself. The worker makes the product, right? But also the worker changes, grows, becomes who they are in this process. For Marx, the worker and the product are two parts of one reality. Secondly, a product represents the relationship between use value and exchange value. The use value is what the product is intended to be used for. Uh, the exchange value is related to the price of the product when it goes to the market. This immediately brings us a third relationship, the relationship between seller and the buyer. The, this relationship often disguises itself as a relationship between people and things, but it is really a relationship fundamentally between people. The confusion there we see are uh, we see a relation only to things instead of between people, Marx calls the fetishism of, a co of commodity. Labor power itself is a special commodity that relates laborers and capitalists. The idea that labor power can be sold on the market took time, historically, to develop. Labor power had to become conceived as an abstract and measurable something. It gets measured in terms of time. If we ignore, as is often done in contemporary capitalist society, the social relations that are embedded in commodities, we move towards a certain understanding of self which is alienated from others by being alienated from the products of labor. When the relation between self and labor no longer fetishizes the products of labor, ignoring the workers and their relationships in the, product, uh, in the production of necessities of life for themselves, Self-actualization uh, self is possible. This is a basic character of communism. Communism is not about absolute uh, equality, pure justice, or complete freedom, all of which notions come out of moral imagination. When labor is no longer a tool of uh, oppressing people, communism can begin, uh, can begin. That is the start of real human history, as Marx said said before, and that is where we can discuss true freedom. Um, two, self and others, dialectical understanding of civil society under capitalism. The relationship between self and others is crucial for modern philosophy. Two main reasons for this should be taken into account here. On the one hand, after the long dark period of the Middle Ages, with the rapid spread of the Enlightenment in Europe, the topic of consciousness began to arise for bourgeois philosophers, especially the idea that human beings could be taken as independent subjects instead of being affiliated. Uh, I think you said affiliated. Affiliated, sorry. Forgive my poor English. <laughs> With social institutions like churches and uh, feudal manors. On the other hand, economies and social development at that time required and simultaneously brought about a new manner of life, that is, individual-based civil society. Marx argues in a critique of Hegel's philosophy of right that in the Middle Ages, each private sphere was indeed political. That is, that the private sphere had, no be, uh, had not been separated from the political sphere. Hegel argues that civil society arises at a certain moment in the development of human social life. Civil society is the battlefield where everyone's individual private interests meets everyone else. 
This reminds one immediately of, Hob uh, of Hobbes' is a war of all against all. Social relationships within a civil society amount to relationships between individuals with needs and individuals with the means to satisfy those needs. The, uh, the operative motives are egoism and selfishness. This is a sphere, uh, sphere of economic life with a general pursuit of selfish ends. In his article on the Jewish question, Marx distinguished two forms of life for human beings. A person has a life both in the political community where she or he is valued as a communal, a communal being and in civil society where she or he is active as a pro private individual treating other people as means to ends. Therefore, it is crucial to analyze the relationship between self and others as well as the meanings of civil society. In the 1844 manuscripts, Marx says, quote, the relation of man to himself first becomes objective and real to him through his relationship to other men. So if he relates to the product of his labor, his objectified labor, as to an object that is alien, hostile, powerful, and independent of him, this, this relationship implies that another man is an alien, hostile, powerful, and independent master of this, pro of this object, end quote. Therefore, in the practical real world, uh, uh, self-alienation can only appear through the practical real relationship to others. The, re uh, the relationship of the worker to her or his labor creates the worker's relationship to the capitalists. Tradition, uh, tradition po uh, political econo uh, economy attributes the concept of external, externalized labor to the movement of private property which does not examine the legitimacy or the history of private uh, property. Marx then claims that although it is um, <coughs> evident from the uh, analysis that private property appears to be the ground and reason for externalized labor, it is rather a consequence of it. We can observe uh, that the bourgeois method uh, is to consider human beings as well as machines as isolated unique units and to view them simply as an existing individuals. In thesis on Feuerbach, Marx says, quote, the highest point reached by contemplative materialism, that is, materialism which does not comprehend sensuousness as practical activity, is the contemplation of single individuals and of civil society, end quote. Civil society, as we, as we have seen, is a condition where each individual merely fends for themselves and their social <coughs> character is concealed. In the German ideology, Marx elaborates the relationship between personal interest and general interest in criticizing Max Stirner. Marx claims that individuals have always started out from themselves and could not do otherwise but that this doesn't really contradict the social reality of people. The standpoint of bourgeois philosophy is always atomized civil society, uh, while the standpoint of Marxist philosophy is human being. Marx discusses the free freedom, uh, the free development of individuals in communist society in the German ideology as well. When individuals are augmented by others, and not in competition with them, they can freely develop as individuals. Such free development of individuals with each other and the, the ab abolition of private property are mutual conditions of each other. Individual-based civil society is not the ultimate state of human development. A higher level of society is possible, while the development of individuals ceases to be mere, a mere phrase but is precisely determined by the connection of individuals. The connection consists partly in economic prerequisites, partly in the necessary solidarity of the free development of all, and finally in the universal character of the activity of individuals on the basis of, of the existing productive forces. Here we can clearly see that Marx puts individuals and their development together with the productive forces. On the one hand, he emphasizes the material condition for individuals. On the other hand,
he considers individuals as a definitely historical state, a definite historical stage of the development. The individual itself is a general condition of the free development of individuals. Thus, society is a complex of relationships among people and of institutions which embody, express, and regularize these relationships. It derive, derives its existence from the, natu- from the nature of people. People are essentially social, and the society is precisely the, ac- the ac- actualization of their social nature. The being of society is not to be distinguished from the being of its members, nor is the essence of people distinguished from the ensemble of social relations. Okay, the last one, self and the state, dialectical inter, uh, interpretation of oppression and freedom. Given alienated labor, that is alienated relations among people under capitalism, it is quite easy to see that the relation between self and the state would also be twisted and alienated. As a matter of fact, this relationship is established through class I- identification and class struggle. In the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, Marx notes that um, the political state has indeed separated from civil society but comes out of civil society. The modern uh, political state exists at the religious sphere of human life in opposition to the mundane sphere of civil society. With civil society and state separated as distinct spheres uh, of human social life, the citizen of the state and the member <coughs> of civil society are also separated. Hegel has fully expressed the strangeness of this development in the philosophy of right, well, uh, where he thinks that this strangeness can be solved within the in- intrinsic na- uh, structure. But Marx argues that the society cannot hear itself without breaking the whole structure, uh, which definitely goes further than Hegel. However, Marx treats seriously Hegel's notion of a universal class, which is a class within society whose, um, whose interests are identical with the interests of society as a whole. Marx's own experience with the Prussian government made it impossible for him to accept Hegel, referring to mere um, bureau, uh, like bureaucratic. Bureau, uh, bureaucratic, uh, yeah, yeah, bureaucracy, right? Bureaucracy. Uh, bureau, uh, bureaucracy. Thank you. <laughs> As such a class, because there is a big malposition between reality and Hegel's ideal models. So, Marx appears to a class whose interests are identical with the interests of humanity universally, a class that can truly transform present society into one adequate to uh, human social nature with a state that is representative of general will. Hegel is forced into inconsistency by his efforts to maintain actuality as rational and satisfy a requirement of his uh, mystical logic. Marx, (laughs) Marx, on the contrary, claims that people are the real subjects of political consciousness and sentiment. Although Marx did not completely jump out of Hegel's framework, and in the critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, he does not start from discussion of produ- uh, productive forces. Still, Marx is already standing on the material basis. The state, for Marx, is not always there and does not exist externally. It only comes out of a certain stage in human history and as a product of the development of human history. Engels says, uh, says that the state arises in order to save certain classes from extinction while conflicts involving um, irreconcilable cons- uh, con- contradictions arise. The state is an inevitable product of human structure and should be considered as a power above civil society and as a mediation of different interests. The relationship, the, uh, the relationship between civil society and the state is as dialectical as that between self and the state. As Marx says in the German ideology, quote, uh, the, fact, the fact is the, def, um, the definite individuals who are productively active in the definite way enter into these definite social and the political re- uh, relations. The social structure and the state are, co- are continually evolving out of the life process of definite individuals, but of individuals not as they may appear in their own or other people's imagination, but as they really are 
as they operate, produce materially, and hence as they work on the definite material limits, pre, uh, suppositions and conditions independent of their will, end quote. That is to say, out of the very contradiction between the interests of the individual and that of the community, the latter, um, the interest of the community takes an independent form as the state, divorced from the real interests of the individual and the community. And at the same time, as an illusory co uh, communal life, always based on real material ties existing in reality. In the past, we simply used to define the state as a tool uh, for the ruling class to oppress people, especially uh, in Lenin's interpretation. Marx himself says similar things in a number of his writings. For example, in the class struggle in France, Marx, uh, Marx accuses the ruling class of exploiting the building of railways in the same way as it exploited state <laughs> expanded, uh, expenditures in general and the state loans. And in... Um, as everybody, uh, as everybody knows, the Communist Manifesto, Marx says, the, uh, the executive of, more, of modern state is but, is but a committee for managing the common affairs of whole bourgeoisie, end quote. However, it is too simple just to interpret the state as a tool of the ruling class. The state has another important function, which is public management just as we should dialectically understand the, the relationship between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, we should also use dialectics to discuss the functions of the state as well as the relations between self and the state. Only when the class pursues the general interests of, of people can it legitimately rule. It is for public management that the proletariat initially takes control of the government. The freedom which liberals appear for uh, does not come out of the analysis of class division, which means it has no historical and dialectical basis. With all real social relations ignored, individuals are abstracted individuals, and the freedom is incomplete freedom. Marx says in the, the Communist Manifesto, quote, by freedom is meant under the present bourgeois conditions of production, free trade, free selling, and buying, end quote. Only through the development of the state which is meanwhile the ensemble of general interests of people, true freedom can be obtained and the state can vanish. Marx goes in the same, uh, in the same text, quote, in place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class an antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is a condition for the free development of all, end quote. So, for Marx, there was a never Robinson Crusoe living isolated out of social contacts. An individual must be within relations, that is, undertaking labor to connect with nature and society, living socially with other people, and sharing a common ideal with the state, and finally sublating it. Thank you. Okay, well, um, maybe we'll we'll hear all of the talks first, and um, then we'll have questions if that's okay with everybody. Okay, so next, um, Justin uh, Justin Holt from NYU. Thank you. I also am going to read a paper. It's um, and uh, and the the title is uh, which conception of the good is compatible with Marx's distributive ideas. So, I will argue in this paper. That Marx's idea about dis distribution are compatible. I'll try my best. Sorry about that. Thank you. It's a. <clears throat> I will argue in this paper that Marx's ideas about distribution are compatible with a pluralistic conception of the good. The paper will have the following parts. First, I will give a brief overview of Marx's distributive ideas. Next, I will discuss two general conceptions of the good. These are pluralistic and perfectionist conceptions of the good. Third, I will show that Marx's distributive ideas are compatible with a pluralistic conception of the good. Finally, I will close with a few comments and mainly questions. It is widely known that Marx was an advocate of a distributive scheme where the means of production would be publicly owned. But exactly what amount of the means of production qualified for public ownership is not as widely understood. In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels argued that parts of the means of production that exploit wage labor would be converted into public property. 
personal property would not be turned into public <coughs> property. Marx and Engels described the distinction between personal and private property as follows. Communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is to deprive him of the power to subjugate the labor of others by means of such appropriation. Marx had a more detailed treatment of distribution in Critique of the Gotha Program. Marx discusses two distributive schema here. One is the point where a communist society emerges from a capitalist society. The second is a higher phase of communist society. I'll discuss the former one first. The distributive schema for an emergent communist society has the following features. One, the means of production is owned as public property. Two, people are able to consume an amount of total production which is equivalent to their expended labor time. Three, this individual consumption is less than deductions for investment, social insurance, administration, social service provision, and transfers. Marx notes that the problem with distributing product to individuals which is equivalent to their expended labor time is that people are different. People have different needs and different numbers of dependents. This means that equal remuneration will not produce equal need satisfaction since people are different. In the higher phase of communist society, Marx seeks to correct this inequality of need satisfaction by recommending the famous principle, and here's a quote of course, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. End quote. This distributive schema will be discussed more later on, but for now it will be pointed out that the inequality of distribution allows for an <coughs> I'll say that again, sorry, I stumbled there. But for now, it will be pointed out that inequality of distribution allows for an intended equality of need satisfaction. In review, Marx advocates the following distributive outcomes. Public ownership of the mean production, means of production, that's one. Two, personal property ownership up to the limit of being able to exploit others. Three, distribution of a portion of total production to the administration of production. Four, distribution of a portion of production for those unable to work. Five, provision of social services for general consumption. Six, distribution according to expended labor time for those who can work um, in emerging communism. And seven, distribution of total product according to need satisfaction during higher phase communism. Now that Marx's distributive ideas have been reviewed, I could turn to providing a definition of the good and an overview of the two conceptions of the good. Simply, the good is a goal or set of goals which an individual or group of individuals seek to attain. Examples of the good can be happiness, knowledge, wealth, friendship, family, public service, glory of God, or sport, to name a few traditional candidates, um, traditional candidates within Western philosophy. That's literally what I should say. The good is usually discussed in philosophy as the end which an individual organizes their life activities for. Some philosophers argue that the good must be singular, in particular Aristotle, um, while others argue that it can be multiform, um, Hobbes most notably. There are two general conceptions of the good, a pluralistic conception and a perfectionist conception. A pluralistic conception of the good is that there is no single goal which individuals or society should seek to attain. A pluralistic conception of the good would find that many goals can be sought within a given society according to an individual's desire. Nonetheless, a pluralistic conception of the good does advocate a set of rules of conduct for the general pursual of multiple goals. In short, a conception of the good which would be considered pluralistic is one which does not focus on only one goal for individuals who pursue. The perfectionist conception of the good is that there is a single goal which individuals or society should seek to attain. This means that decisions regarding the selection of rules of conduct would be made according to the demands of attaining the single goal. A perfectionist society can have a weak perfectionist conception of the good or a strong one. Examples of weak perfectionist goals will be the attainment of knowledge, wealth, or the general glory of God at the expense of all other goals. Examples of strong perfectionist goals will be such as like the terraforming of Mars or the construction of a particular edifice for <coughs> God at the expense of all other goals. So, now that the two general conceptions of the good have been reviewed, I will show that Marx holds a pluralistic conception of the good in all of the distributive outcomes he argues for. Marx asserts in the manifesto and in the emerging communist phase outlined in the Gotham program 
that people would individually consume their share of total production and own personal property. The conversion of private property into public property is not the elimination of individual uses of the product of society. Rather, the conversion of pu private property into public property may allow for an increase in the possibility of individual uses since, quoting, communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society, end quote. Thus no one would be denied, <coughs> thus, no one would be denied use of the publicly owned means of production. But in higher phase communism, would there be a change towards a more perfectionist conception of society? Does the distributive principle, once again <coughs> quoting, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs, end quote, lead to a singular perfectionist goal? In this distributive principle, um, excuse me, is this distributive principle a requirement for people to work towards a single goal at the expense of all other goals? I will argue that this is not the case. First, there is no mention of a single goal which excludes all others in the quoted passage. Um, rather, the satisfaction of individual needs is the goal listed. Also, the means of this goal are abilities in general and not the specific development of particular abilities. Second, from each according to their abilities will be pluralistic if one's, excuse me, second, from each according to their abilities would be pluralistic if the exercising of one's abilities also fulfills one's needs. That is, one has abilities which can be used to contribute to total production, but, also has, but one also has a need to contribute in particular ways. Thus, one can contribute to society in ways which best meet one's needs. So, wrapping things up. So, in this paper, I've shown that Marx argues for a pluralistic conception of the good um, in his distributive comments. Some of the more obvious questions which I think should be asked in future research are, is there a perfectionist conception of the good which can be distinctly socialist? Um, can the goal of building socialism be a perfectionist goal, or is socialism the result of a society where the populace in general holds a pluralistic conception of the crafting of norms? And finally, socialism appears to be a better means to achieve a pluralistic conception of the good than capitalism due to public ownership of the means of production. Is this true? Um, thank you. I look forward for your comments later on. <laughs> Okay, well, so I will, um, I'm going to only partly read uh, and partly talk. Uh, um, I, I, I've written it as a paper, and I've been writing a longer piece around these topics, um, but I'm, I'm going to try not to, to just read, um, though there's a couple quotes that I'm going to read to you. I'll start with a quote. The Indian must be imbued with the exalting egotism of American civilization so that he will say I instead of we and this is mine instead of this is ours. That was um, the commissioner of Indian Affairs. Named, his name is John Oberly in 1888. Yeah, well, uh, if, you, um, if you recall your Hegel, Hegel very famously, you know his book, he has a book called The Phenomenology of Spirit, and his defined spirit is not a supernatural category in Hegel, <coughs> even though it sounds to us in English like it's supernatural. It's not a supernatural thing. It, it just means the community. That's all Hegel means by spirit. You can think of it like we use the word team spirit. You know, it's like what holds the team together. You know, spirit. Who Hegel, is. Hegel is a German philosopher and racist. White, white supremacist racist. Um, who is very influential, though, on, on Marx. And on, uh, Marx rejected a lot of Hegel's thinking, but he got a lot from Hegel as well. Uh, but not the, not the racism, fortunately, um, and the white supremacy. Marx was very against white supremacy. He argues that in the book that Jinro talked about the German ideology that Marx and Engels wrote in 1845. But if you remember Hegel's notion of spirit, which I know many of you might not be that familiar with Hegel, Hegel defines spirit as the I that is we and the we that is I. So he means the self, the individual, is sunk into the community in very you know, concrete ways. 
right? The self identifies with their role in the community. Now, so when he's, when, I find it so fascinating that this, in 1888, this, this uh, uh, commissioner of Indian affairs speaks in these terms. In fact, I found this, this passage came in a book, I'm sorry, came in a movie, a film, a documentary film called Red Cry which you can see online. It's free. It's, it's on YouTube. And I really recommend you watch it. It's, it's, it's not just about the history in the 19th century of the Lakota Indians or the Lakota tr nation in, <coughs> who now live mainly in South Dakota uh, on the Pine Ridge and Cheyenne River and Rosebud Reservation, but um, it's about that contemporary struggle, which is very, very serious. And, and they are the probably the most impoverished people in the country uh, Include barring none, they they have 85 percent unemployment on the reservation. They are starving. Their children are still to this day taken away from them. It's pretty brutal. The, and high suicide rates. I mean, it is and high high rates of uh, alcoholism. They're living in in a um, a very troubling condition right now. Um, in the movie Red Cry, in the film, in the context of it. Uh, before this quote is given, uh, the narrator says, in 1887, the U.S. Congress approved the General Allotment Act to divide communal land of the Great Sioux Reservation. Sioux is the European name for the Lakota people. It's not a Lakota word. It's a French, from the French. Uh, and I think it's related to a, a, a Lakota word which meant enemy. <laughs> so it's a very strange thing that people call them the Sioux. Indians, but that's what U.S. government often calls them, the Great Sioux Reservation. So anyway, I'm sorry. In 1887, the U.S. Congress approved the General Allotment Act to divide communal land of the Great Sioux Reservation into individual parcels of privately owned property. Well, they didn't have this idea. Assigned to tribal members. Our people had no concept of individual ownership of, the Mother, Earth, of Mother Earth. Okay. So what I, want to, what I want to get to is, in, even in European philosophy, white Western European philosophy that we think of you know, coming from Plato and Aristotle, Aristotle says the self, that, that humans are a political animal, right? A social animal. He, Aristotle sees us as social and as defined in our social relations. And he also, in the Nicomachean Ethics, he argues that it's our role in society that defines who we are. So this idea is not foreign to the West. It's not foreign to Europeans. But it has been sunk and hidden. You know, Hegel argues that it's Christianity that created the individual because it has its, its sinners, you know, who need to repent and get reborn as individuals, right? You must be born anew. So Hegel argues that it's, it's Christianity that led to the development of this notion of the lone, isolated individual. Marx argues, uh, Marx and Engels argue that um, it, you know, capitalism played a fundamental role in this because this mythology of the lone individual is so crucial to capitalist development. And you see here that John Overly, this, this um, commissioner of Indian affairs in 1888, is saying he sees that. And in the context of the report from which this is taken, because when I heard it on the film, I went and looked it up, and it is in that report, uh, and I looked up the report. And in the context of the paragraph that he makes this claim, he says that the, the indigenous people, he doesn't say, he says the Indians, are living in um, what he calls, um, let me find the exact phrase, degrading communism. That's his word, <laughs> degrading communism. They live in degrading communism. And we have to de destroy the sense of self that they have, which is communal, which is deeply tied, not just to, and I, I, not just to the social ties, but and this is an important part, which it's almost impossible at first for our minds trained, for or for those of us who are trained in the Western tradition. It takes time, and um, as in the, if you went to the indigenous panel yesterday, a decolonizing of our thinking in order to understand that. This is not such a foreign notion, and it need not be, but in European thought it is. This self is defined by who they are in their, among their people, but who they are in relation to the land, in relation to earth and water, and to the, the physical facts of their lives. 
in a way, they're Marxists long before Marx was. All right, not to understand and recognize this, and not to see that Marx, the West, is catching up with these ideas that who we are is not simply isolated individuals opposed to each other and opposed to a, a hostile environment that we have to violently dig our lives out of, produce you know, with industrial production. And, you know, the, there's that, there's a great quote by Trotsky I love to think about. It's long, but I'll read it to you because I think it's, it's, it's very deeply indicative of the relationship to nature that the West has developed, but that we find within communism, within the communist tradition. Trotsky. This is going to be Trotsky. I'm going to read to you a very famous quote by Trotsky. Trotsky is one of the two famous uh, leaders of the Russian Revolution in 1917. Okay, uh, Lenin and Trotsky, right? And Trotsky was later exiled by Stalin, you know, uh, in the 1920s, the late 1920s. Uh, this is Trotsky. Um, the present distribution of mountains and rivers, of fields, of meadows, of steppes of forests, of seashores, cannot be considered final. Man has already made changes in the map of nature that are not, are, are not few nor insignificant, but they are mere pupils' practice in comparison to, with what is coming. Faith, like religious faith, merely promises to move mountains. Jesus said, you know, if you have faith, you can move a mountain. So he's referring to that. Faith merely promises to move mountains, but technology which takes nothing on faith, and he puts on faith in quotes, is actually able to cut down mountains and move them. Up to now, this was done for industrial purposes, for ra- mines or for railways, tunnels. In the future, this will be done on an immeasurably larger, larger scale according to a general industrial and artistic plan. Man will occupy himself with re-registering mountains and rivers and will earnestly and repeatedly make improvements in nature. In the end, he will have rebuilt the earth, if not in his own image, at least in his own taste. We have not the slightest fear that this taste will be bad. (laughs) I find it so ironic that he says, you know, technology takes nothing on faith, but then he has not the slightest fear of this. If this is not faith... In the possibility of, and you know, just being completely optimistic about what tampering with nature is going to bring about. But right now, okay, we could look at this and just say, "You got to be kidding!" I hope we say that, especially in this ecology-based, you know, left forum. Which why didn't they have any Lakota people or indigenous people on the uh, opening plenary? Is a question that we should all ask ourselves. People who are deeply, deeply uh, understanding of these relationships to nature. That, uh, uh, that 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 they, they were not represented on the opening plenary is quite shocking to me. But they're not Marxists. they're not Marxists. Well, this isn't the Marxist forum; it's the left forum. So you don't have to be a Marxist to participate here. Now, I'm a Marxist, but I'm also critical of Marx. A healthy Marxist is critical of Marx. So anyway, I hope. Maybe I'm wrong, but I hope. But, um, look, the self for the Lakota and for many other peoples of the, of the world is not simply a relation between, it's not an isolated individual, and it's not just a relation between persons. It's a relation between persons and a relation to nature, a relation to land. And we separate those things in European thought, but in the nations of non-European peoples, like the Lakota And um, people, um, I'll read you a quote. I have a couple of quotes here that are quite good. I I have a quote from Carolyn Elkin's book uh, called Imperial Reckoning. This came out in 2005, which is quite good. Uh, She's not a Marxist either, but it's quite a good book. The subtitle is The Untold Story of Britain's Gulag uh, in Kenya. It's a story, basically, of the Kenyan um, resistance, uh, the Mau Mau Revolution, and the way the Britons, the British, um, the brutality of the British, the British basically um, pretty much incarcerated every single, or almost every single, Kikuyu person uh, in Kenya uh, in the, during the, that period, the Mau Mau revolutions, as so it's called. 
so-called Mau Mau. Mau Mau is not a Kenyan word. It's not a Kikuyu word. It's a word the British used making fun of indigenous, the, the people of Africa. Uh, but we do use it, sadly. Um, it's the word we use for that period. But um, I'm going to read you a quote from... I'll read you a quote not from her, from this book, but a quote from a book called Urugu uh, by Marimba Ani. Uh, I think this is an interesting book that's worth reading. It's a critique of European thought from an African perspective. And here's what she says about generalizing about African perspectives. In the African worldview, the European dichotomy of opposition between individual and the group collapses. And instead of the person and the community, they're defined, they're defined in terms of each other. They are interdependent, merging beings who together form meaningful reality. And she goes on about that. And I'm going to skip to another quote that has a similar thing from a, another African um, writer named uh, John Mbiti. Maybe some of you have heard him. I think I brought his book. This is African, uh, African Religion and Philosophy by John Mbiti. This is a classic. It came out in the 1960s, and I recommend everybody should read it because he talks a lot, especially about nature uh, and social relations and how that contributes to the notion of self, how the, the conception of self among African peoples. Uh, John Mbiti writes in his uh, book, traditional African religions are not primarily for the individual, but for his community of which he is a part. Chapters of African religions are written everywhere in the life of the community. And in traditional society, there are no irreligious people. To be human is to belong to the whole community. And to do so involves participating in the beliefs, ceremony, rituals, and festivals of that community. A person cannot detach himself from the religion of his group, for to do so is to be severed from his roots, his foundations, his context of security, his kinships, and the entire group of those who make him aware of his own existence. To be without these corporate elements of life is to be out of the whole picture. Therefore, to be without religion amounts to a self-excommunication from the entire life of society. The African peoples do not know how to exist without religion. Now, that brings me to this notion of religion. To our mind, what, who's our? Who's the we I'm talking about? To our mind. to uh, The mind that's trained in European thinking, like I've been, white thinking, white European thinking, the idea of religion comes from a certain historical development okay, in the West. And when Marxists criticize it, I think, and including Marx himself, he has in mind the use of religion for class oppression. And his understanding that religion will disappear with class oppression is, I love it, great, and I'm an atheist. I'm not here to support religion in the Western sense. But that's the Western sense. Everything, therefore, that is part of indigenous and non-Western, non-Europeanized thinking is just wrong for Marx, if you take that reading very literal. It just has to go. But that means those people have to go. Because that's who those people are, if you take these kinds of thoughts seriously. Now, we don't want to think of John Oberly as a Marxist. I would rather not think of John Oberly as a Marxist. So I'd rather make, to create a, a way of thinking that separates what John Oberly is doing from what I'm doing. What I think I'm doing. You can see a meme, you know, on Facebook or something. What I think I'm doing, what I'm actually doing. Oberly being Oberly is the guy who gave that quote about we have to destroy that degrading communism and we have to take, you know, the Indian must be imbued with the exalting egotism of American civilization so that he will say I instead of we uh, and this is mine instead of this is ours. Let me um, draw a little picture. See, I came prepared because I was afraid. So here's individuals. And 
The individualist conception of the good that Justin was talking about says each of these individuals has their own private conception. Each of these people are atoms. And here's the other conception, the other pole, that the summum bonum in, I don't know if I'm spelling that right, but close enough. Yeah. So the, the, in Latin, that means the, the greatest good, right? The greatest good. Or the, what do, how do we translate that? Is that how you translate it? Usually, right? Yeah, the greatest good. So these are the two poles that, that you have. Society could be seeking this, or society can just be a bunch of atoms duking it out, you know, fighting it out for each of their private conceptions of the good. But I think what, what, what Jinro and, and, and Justin, uh, Jinro is especially saying that, well, on Marx's conception, we have to see that people have relations to each other in various ways. You know, I'm, re I'm related, you know, here's a relation I have. I'm wearing this shirt. So I'm related to the workers who made this shirt. You know, these women, and it's mostly women who work in garment industry globally, the women who made this shirt, you know, I'm in a relation with. It's not, you know, we have our word relation. You say that, that means, you know, I'm in a relation with them. I, I'm, I've bought this shirt. Well, Sheila bought it for me, actually. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's our, um, I've paid for it. They did the labor that sewed this together. They did the labor that probably picked the materials that, that went into this. Who knows, in our global economy and the vertical int integration of our global, how this shirt came about through many, many workers in many, many parts of the world. Okay, um, we have all of these crisscrossing relations to people that define ourselves. And but one thing that's missing from this conception is not just the relations that de facto, you know, come up because of our economic interrelations with each other, right? But our relations to each other um, through. Um, the people we're from, the, the groups, which historically are very real. These are not illusory. They're not fake. It's not just identity politics ideas that some kooky person who's an anti-Marxist came up with. These are real things that are historically actual. And when an idea grips the masses, it becomes a material force, Marx told us. So we cannot just ignore the historical reality of different nations thinking that goes into defining these people as they make these relations. You with me? We can't cut off this middle social ground. And what are the Marxists, some Marxists saying? Here we are, the Marxists. You know, that's us. We came out of European tradition. And what we're supposed to do is teach all of these other guys that they have to sort of disappear. Uh-uh. That ain't for me. I'm a Marxist, and I understand what's great in Marx, but that's not where I'm going. That's, there's something intrinsically, deeply wrong with that. I'm not going to tell the Lakota people, you are an ancient thing that has to be destroyed. I'm not John Oberly. You hear me? So anyway, that's my kind of message. I'm going to just leave it there. I have a lot more to say about it, but I'm going to leave it there because I think I've gone over my 20 minutes already. So. Uh, maybe now uh, we can take questions and and hear hear your thoughts. So. Yeah. Plakhanov brought 
Marxism to Russia, which meant because he established that there did have to be a bourgeois revolution in Russia, that you couldn't just adopt the commune of the peasants, that you had to have industrialization. And so I don't think Marx, I mean, was saying that uh, we have to force people into these things, but they will happen because people want to industrialize and people want modernization. Uh, and they're being stopped from it, yeah. actually. Yeah. So this thing, this bull that that guy was writing, he certainly wasn't applying it to women and the family when he said we have to, those little plots of land that he was going to give out to the Lakota, we're all going to have a male head. Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, so I just want to make one more point, and that is, along with industrialization, and speaking as a radical feminist, that there's something to be said among people for whom the self has been suppressed, i.e. women, to have these little bourgeois revolutions for women where individualism and the self is liberated before we can then unite in a new basis. Any comments? Yeah. Well, I, I'll just start with, um, first of all, the, the fight against the Lakota was specifically to make men, it was against the matriarchal char character of Lakota, traditional Lakota society, it was matriarchal. But it wasn't for liberating, liberated families with female heads. Not at all. The, 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 what Oberly was talking about was specifically to destroy um, the Lakota matriarchal society. Yeah. It was specifically for that purpose. It was particularly aimed at that. If you watch that film, Red Cry, they... Th but they weren't really matriarchal. Yes, they were. So, yes, they were, in fact. Oh, I don't... Well, that's another... You need, to, you need to talk to Teokasen and... I've read a lot about it, and I don't Well, just talk to Teokasen and many... Were the warriors, you know. Right. You should talk to some of the Lakota people who are here at the left forum right now. They'll talk to you about it, and they, they know what their society is. Well, a lot of women will tell you they rule the family. I agree. I mean, I think that that's that this. There, you're really. I'm with the message you're giving. I'm just trying to um, talk a little about what the purpose was. You're absolutely. I'm. I'm actually trying to defend what you're saying. They were defending notions of family themselves differ from society to society, just like notions of individuals do, and that those notions are deeply. Um, ingrained in the different practices. We Westerners like to believe our practices are, you know, probably the best, and we Marxists love to think that um, somehow Marxism is going to liberate and solve every problem, including internal family problems and issues of the sexes. I don't believe that that's true. I think that we need specifically to address these things in conscious, explicit ways, just like with race, with gender. These are not going to be magically dissolved because of Marxism. Unless we start creating a theory and a practice of creating a new society in this one that specifically addresses these kinds of issues and reconstructs those relations, um, that's not going to happen. But anyway, uh, others, yeah. Did you, did you want to comment at all? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, firstly, I'm really sorry that you missed a, that uh, most of part of my talk. But I think, yes, you're right. At, um, Maybe, you know, like the power of ideology is so strong that uh, when I'm talking about the Marx uh, notion of self and compared to what I thought, uh, what, what I think of like is the bourgeois ideology, uh, under the bourgeois ideology, the, the notion of self, that um, very individual, that pure abstract individual. And that lady just told me it's not, it's not uh, you know, like just real every like a uh, pure abstract individual but it's a family like male dot right dominated individual i think it's right and um, when we talk about every individual in this society um, we just kind of miss the, in the the situation that this is not equal in our society uh, not only in the states but in china and i think uh, one way of thinking about this way is Marx's uh, approach of like thinking about these things is a historical development, and it's not not only social but historical. Like in you know, like I think in a long period of historical development, then we, what we are fighting for, what we are pursuing, can be you know like fulfilled in the future. So when we talk about things in nowadays, 
and uh, uh, we should have such a kind of social context and the uh, notion of history in our mind. So yes, I agree with you. <laughs> and thank you for mentioning that. And, and Justin, and then yeah, it's a, to respond to this, it's a, this is a, your, your consideration about the, the place of the family um, um, and, the, uh, and the consideration of the, the, the male head of, the head of household or the male breadwinner um, model is, um, is deeply ingrained within Western philosophy. And, it's a, and what usually is done is that there's a consideration is that there's a, a, a move is made in order to basically say, well, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about politics, and this is how most philosophers will set it up. And then they might have a, a position where they basically render it as, um, as the, the, the family is, in many ways, is non-political. Um, Aristotle does the, 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 the penultimate move, the ultimate move with this. What he does is he basically does a naturalistic determination of the family. And he basically does something like this. He says, well, people have different natural abilities. And what Aristotle does is says that basically men, adult men, have the, the, the ultimate capability of reason. And then he goes on to talk about how women have less reason and children don't have any reason at all. And then he defines slaves as being necessary to basically lord it over. They can't take care of themselves. So what Aristotle does is that basically Aristotle constructs the family as a mechanism that needs to be controlled, that needs to be has supervision. The male basically supervises the household and then could go out and participate in politics. Um, this, and so when people talk about politics, it's always about the, the civil society, so to speak. It's the life outside of the family. The family is complete, do, domin, this complete dominion by, by the husband. So, and this is how Western philosophy has constructed it. And you can see this repeated throughout time. Um, it's, uh, you can see it occur again um, in Hegel. It's, um, you can see the lack of the family and the lack of, uh, basically, of, of sexual reproduction occurring in the Anglo-American tradition. It's always run roughshod over. I um, mean, even in Rawls. Rawls basically assumes the family unit, and then that's it. He wants to talk about individual actors. And so the real consideration with this is that basically in order to under... We, of course, this is what has been going on, and this is the, one of the major contributions that feminism has done over its very long history, is to say that the family unit is not apolitical. It's not pre-political, right? It is shaped by a political world. Um, so you, this comment is very apropos, and to understand basically individual desires and the meeting of individual needs, we have to say that's not solely of the public actor, a, solely the, of the male actor. What are the, ma the needs of the male public actor? We have to say what are the needs for all these other actors who have very different roles in society? Um, so this, this question is, is getting really at the heart of the say, and this is to say that the, the family has to be re-understood as a political unit that is shaped by its society. Um, and can be changed, can be altered, right? And there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff that's basically done about saying, well, um, uh, when, like say, when women receive transfers from the state and they get it personally and it's transferred into, let's say, wives' accounts and they have control over that money, they have, a, they have what is called voice. They have a much stronger position called voice and a greater threat of exit within the family. So basically by politicizing the family, by basically making it possible, saying how can we increase the political power of women within the family, this alters these dynamics where the family is solely this tyrannical dominion of the male actor. Um, this question, you know, is, you know, as Russell pointed out and some other thinkers, is, 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 is discussed since it's not been our focus, but it's, 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 it's important to, to recognize when we talk about individuals and individuals. And the self. And the self and the integration with other people. It's, um, is that Western philosophy, is what it's done is it's bracketed. It's basically defined it as non-political. Um, and it's, it's it, that's incorrect. Um, it's a, uh, um, and it's good to criticize that. Yeah, we should all read Aristotle Definitely. and look how brilliant he is, and then say, "Well, you're wrong too." So, it's great. But good. That's it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good question. Well, this gentleman. Yeah. All right. I guess I have a couple things. Uh, I was, was, you know, on your your talk, I, I was just, uh, I think that was like a question, like, um, do you think that the theory, um, do you think that people are like inherently selfish? I, I, I wonder that. Like a question for you. Uh, the next one was, um, does the theory of self in the, like, the European tradition come from Aristotle? or the, And also, does it like the self a part of like nuclear family? And then, um, and then the third thing is like the greatest good. Like it seems like, like present time, the greatest good, it seems like it's trickling down from like the, the capital, like you know, the people who own capital, the greatest they feel that the greatest good um, is, Giving uh, computers to create, you know, capitalists twenty years from now, and 
like the third world. And dealing with like this this whole diagram, like the Marxists, they have a certain perspective. The Lakota people have a different perspective. How do you deal with people? Um, capitalists, you know, making people and atomize people and like uh, creating uh, a counter perspective. How do you how do you find that like line that connects everyone to fight against the, the people who have this capital who are pushing people <coughs> these atomized people? All right, well, thank you. Yeah, um, of course I don't think people are like born naturally, uh, inherently like you say, selfish. Because uh, I'm a learner of Western philosophy and I'm a learner of Western history. But uh, as far as I know, in Chinese traditional philosophy, like Asian Chinese philosophy, we have kind of um, discussion about the human nature and we have <coughs> different, like, different opinions about it. Someone says it's like uh, human nature is good and someone says human nature is bad, but it's selfish kind of things. But uh, I think uh, maybe uh, some similar things uh, or similar thoughts uh, will like appear in Western philosophy, but I think for Marx, the nature of human being is social, or is determined by the society. So you cannot say people is just selfish, or people is good, or uh, is bad, but naturally bad or good. Uh, I think it's determined by the society, like where you live and the persons. <coughs> Um, like around you or the whole society or the whole social structure, such kind of things. But I think like a bourgeois ideology, or they, they just tell us that everyone is selfish and everyone fights for their own interests. So that's like br brainwash some kind of thing like that, that makes us to believe that everyone f fights for their own interests. So that's a society, it looks like this way. So I don't think Marx has such kind of like expression about this question. Okay, well, um, that's one of the fundamental, your question about, like, so the Marxists are here and, you know, there's, you know, Dakota people or whatever. Nationalists yeah, so whatever. how does it, that's fundamentally what, what ultimately I, I'm aiming at is the praxis, the, the, the practical question of how do we can take the, Mar the Marxist analysis and use it to, for, for, to make allegiances, these are, all of these peoples, let's say, are enemies of capital. They're all enemies of capital. And we as Marxists see them, therefore, as potential allies, because we're enemies of capital. But their way of conceiving of this is different from our way. And there are fundamental flaws. Like, I mean, if you would have read that Trotsky quote to a Lakota person, you know, they would have just said, I don't know what you're doing. I ain't doing that. And I, I'm not going there. That's crazy. You know, that's just ludicrous. Are you saying there are flaws that they're religious? Is that what you were getting at with the African passage? No. Okay, so what is the flaw that the Marxists see in the other communal societies? Well, um, is your name Catherine? Kathy. Kathy, yeah. As Kathy said, a lot of these questions are dealt with in Marx. And I, you know, didn't have time to really get into all of that. And she's absolutely right when she says that. I'm really talking about Marxist practice in, uh, in the 20th century as it's often actually the concrete universal of Marxist practice as it's actually been played out um, has been things like the Trotsky quote and people's view of anything that non-Western people do is somehow religious. You see, they look at it that way, superstitious, it's superseded. And one thing that, um, to, to deal with what you just said, Kathy had said earlier that as these people have not yet gone to industrial relations, well, hello, this, that's not going to happen. People are not, Trotsky was right about another thing. He's wrong, I think he's crazy about the thing I read, but he's right about another thing. Capital develops unevenly. Capitalism does not develop everywhere in the world. Capitalism is centrally controlled still by European and American U.S. Uh, capitalists today. Okay? Yes, there are other capitalists around the world, but you know, in many ways, the, the domination of the rest of the world is still through European and U.S. financial institutions and Europe, U.S. military power uh, and, and, and how that military power is materially s s sustained. Um, 
they're never going to allow the people. The people in Indonesia get to work in the sweatshops, okay? And in that way, a few of them, you know, you, you create this giant army of surplus labor by disrupting um, the um, organic relationship to the land and to each other that people had in their organic way of producing the their means of life. The capitalists and the colonialist imperialism has disrupted that, but they have not replaced all of those workers as industrial. They took a small portion and they put them in sweatshops, yes. And they may organize along those proletarian, industrial workers, kind of proletarian, making a union like the, um, um, the Indian water workers now are making unions, um, the Bangladeshi garment workers, as we've been hearing, if you watch Democracy Now!, you know about the Bangladeshi building that uh, factory that broke down and killed over a thousand people. Um, the fires that have been there that have you know, been frequent. Um, there are a small, I mean, they're a large group, but they're relatively small compared to the people in those societies who have been disrupted from their organic relation to the land. So many of those other people who are not in there, you know, they go into the inner cities, they become the, you know, they st st drug dealers or their the prostitution is rife, yeah. you know, human trafficking is huge today. You know, these, these other relationships. Now, these people who are not caught up in union organization, they're still enemies of, they've been harmed by capital. But they're certainly not conceiving things, and they're not going to naturally or easily conceive things. And they're, I, I think, probably the vast bulk of the, of the planet. I mean, in India, 80% of the population lives on less than 50 cents a day. 20 rupees, 50 cents a day. Okay, that's, you know, astonishing. They have more poverty there than in all of Africa. 900 million people are in desperate well, just, I think that this idea of unity, of unity thought, right? I think it, I think it goes through each one of your, uh, your your talks. I mean, your talk has to do with uh, you know the sensual self as a unit, but then the social self as a relationship, a unit of relationship. And I think also that's where where, where your speech is going as well, or, or, or at least it's a it's a it's a way of interacting with your talk uh, as far as. The, the perfectionist society, the, uh, the, the, the other one is... <coughs> pluralistic. Yeah, pluralistic. Um, that there is something in Marxism. What, what Marxism, like for instance, in the African quote you talked about, the last thing he says is that there's no conception of an African outside of religion, right? And I think that was kind of ironic. He's saying that's what religion is. Religion is this unitive experience. And... Um, and that's why I don't think that necessarily we have to carry the Marxist critique of religion everywhere, because the African experience of religion is, is not, as you were saying, the Western. It's just an experience of a, a unitive experience, which right. I think Marx is probably trying to, 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 to get to. Well, and fundamentally for, uh, for non-European peoples that we're talking about, Lakotas or the Kikuyu, the, the, the so-called religion, because it's, I'm saying so-called not because it's not real in, for them, but because it's, our conception of religion isn't really what that is. Exactly. And Their it's not, conception. It's not an opiate, right? I mean, it's not an opiate in that sense. It's it's just it's not what, the, what we associate with the Marxist critique of religion. It is, in fact, directly encoding their organic way of metabolizing with Earth. Okay, they are there. It's part of their means of production. All right. You're saying it's primitive socialism, right? I mean, I don't. I don't use the word primitive. I think that's an un very unfortunate and very racist and well, Eurocentric term. But yeah, I mean, that essentially, I think that that needs to be reconceptualized and reworded. Proto yeah. Proto socialism. Yeah. 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 Um, um, Betty. Yeah. I, this is scattered, but one of the things the gentleman over there said about humans being inherently selfish, um, I think there's a Hindu track um, that deals with the, where they said first there was a void, and then it was self, and then self was afraid because self found out it was alone. And then um, it decided to divide, to divide itself into male and female, etc. And you can say that females are inferior, 
But then when you come to the European uh, interpretation of Christianity, you see that uh, not only on women, period, but they're responsible for sin. And when you continue that further, then you see an interpretation that some people are human and others are not, and that this is God saying that, and of course the people are not of the color. Um, but again, I said this is scattered. One of the things I always um, appreciated about Joseph Campbell is that he talks about the origins of, the, of most societies. They were communal, regardless of whether males or females dominated. They had no concept of self separate from community. And one of the critiques he gives of part of the problem with what we call it capitalism, industrialism, or materialism, is that um, once the individual is the most important unit, you totally lost the concept of community, and you have lost the ability to organize, to deal with the ultimate individual, which is the, is the super nova capitalist. Mm. He doesn't use those words. Again, I'm saying this is scattered um, yeah. because I never felt when I looked at Marx, I studied it on my own. I, I never took a class on Marx. I was really young. One of my concerns is that he didn't really, really address the issue that they didn't have real, real capitalism until they, you know, started massacring people and taking them out. That was the first capitalist yeah, well, actually, Marx does say that. He says the, the history of what he calls primitive accumulation of capital by the Europeans is a history of its bloody, well, who, who knows that quote? Yeah, drowning in blood, blood and dirt. Yeah, he, he's, 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 he says it's, na it was. Trading company, the Dutch yeah, company, yeah trading company. Well, well, he doesn't specifically mention, but, yeah. but that's what, he does mention them in wow. his discussion of this process. I didn't say he didn't mention yeah. them. Yeah, yeah. I felt they should have had a, a far more Yeah. So the point I'm making is, the issue of selfishness, I think, becomes real when you don't consider that you are a part of the community. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. I will give Rousseau credit for saying mm -hmm. this one thing. Mm -hmm. We absolutely will not tolerate you becoming a slave. You just mm -hmm. cannot do that. Mm -hmm. Whatever social contract you have, mm -hmm. you can't become an economic slave. You can't become a spirit slave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we're all going to survive, you just can't do it. And I will give um, the, the culture of the people who call themselves the Indians that much credit. There is a king, I forgot, what is it, Bhutan? When he recognized his country was, his little tiny kingdom was in trouble. He traveled all over the world to see the best forms of democracy. And one of the things they feared the most was the commercialization of the beauty of their women. You know, they don't have, they did not want the Western model to take over. And the thing he felt was most important was that you had to have a communal school system where everybody got educated and everybody was taught the best they could in terms of truth. And it had to be in collaboration with the land. And this place is now considered one of the best places to live. I'm just saying this king consciously went about looking at what was best and what was worst of all the areas uh, in the world that consider themselves progressive. And I'll end again, this is a scattered discussion coming from me. But one of the things Ali Majri said about the contacts of people, as uh, Francis Wilson would say, lacking male and people had known mm -hmm. was that it was a deliberate de-civilization of any culture they mm -hmm. came in contact yeah. with. And I will never forget that when Columbus or Cortez, Christian Felsen, met the Tainos mm -hmm. in what we call Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. they had no word for lying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no word for why. Mm -hmm. So I I don't know how in the world you can factor in that concept when you're talking about the self 
but people who have absolutely no word for telling a lie. That's why they needed instruction. Uh, well, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah. And they're not here anymore, so evidently nature made a mistake with them, right? According to Dawn. Right, yes. Yeah. Any comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I hear everything. I think that's, you're, you're right with what I'm, anyway, what I'm thinking about, um, Betty. Uh, I, I think um, I'm not as happy to give the Hindu religion that much credit. Hindu religion is not like an indigenous religion. It's a, it's a very different system and it's very oppressive and it does actually say that women are inferior to men. In fact, they're filthy and dirty and they are considered untouchable uh, in Hinduism. It's true. Uh, at least among many. Of course, there are liberal Hindus today who are trying to change that. Since the bourgeois liberal um, Hinduism of the early 19th century, um, there has been this movement because the, uh, the up, and these are, it's an upper caste movement, which is, you always have to keep in mind. It, it, there's an upper caste movement that's a liberal upper caste movement against the caste system, and yet it never gets rid of the caste system. All right, it still holds on to it. It doesn't find, even when it has political power, the, the ability, I'm sorry? Like Gandhi. Gandhi is a good example. Gandhi is from an upper caste. You know, he's like from the second highest caste, and he, you know, he thinks that he will. He he refused to give uh, political representation to the Dalit people. In 1931, he uh, his most his longest fast, his most famous satyagraha, his famous longest fast was in, in the I think October 1931 against the Pune. What resulted in the Pune resolution where he basically forced Ambedkar, who later wrote the Constitution of India, uh, to, you know, pull back from his demand that the Dalit people have political representation. Okay, and this was a fundamental moment in the history of the struggle for liberation of the Indian people, but it defined that the caste system was going to stay there in India. And Gandhi was fighting for the caste system in doing this. Gandhi is not, Gandhi, you know, we've sainted him largely because the British imperialists sainted him because they could deal with him. Not because he is really, you know, yes, he fought this. No, I know, I know, I'm just, I'm just saying what, what my, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. It starts off with the concept itself mm. as being afraid. I know. I'm just and throwing my stuff in. I hear you. And I think anytime people are afraid of women, they're dangerous. And I, but I think you're also right that um, we all started. There's a great book by Leacock and Lee, Barbara Leacock, and I forget Lee's. Eleanor Leacock. Eleanor Leacock. And what's, what's Lee's name? Uh-huh. Eleanor Leacock and something Lee. He's a man. Um, called Banned Societies and something. If, I highly recommend this book. It, it, it came out, I think, in 1981. Um, it's, it's a book about banned societies, which is like communal societies that still exist today. And about how, it discusses in depth how we came from, we all came from communal societies. There's no such thing as the lone, isolated individual, but we are all defined in terms of um, our social relations. So, Anyway, do, any other comments? Yeah. I, um, you've been raising your hand for a while. Yeah. Um, I guess when we were talking about uh, the, um, the dichotomy here, uh, human nature dichotomy, would you agree that um, that that could be, I mean, that is the foundation of all political philosophy, the dichotomy of altruism versus evil? I mean, it's the basis of the difference between, you know, Hobbes and... I wouldn't agree with that personally. Uh, you know, first of all, political philosophy, you mean all Western European political philosophy? I mean, in general, Marx has... No, that. Hobbes is not... Ta- Marx is not talking about whether people are altruistic or not. People, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, re- I mean, I realize he doesn't um, address it specifically. Yeah. But would you say that that's the, uh, the key difference in um, our formation of our association of the self is going to be determined by whether or not we believe humans are altruistic or not? Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't agree with that, um, but I, I can understand why. I mean, it's very common for us to feel that way coming from white Western culture. I assume you're a white Western trained person. 
And that's part of our training. We're trained to think in that way. But I don't think other people necessarily, other people necessarily think that way or feel that way. And I don't think we have to. Once you realize that others don't do that, it's like, yeah, why do we do that? So why? you're saying there are peoples that don't have a conception of evil or wrong, good or evil? What, what you altruism. mean by evil and, all, and wrong and what, yeah, what we mean by altruism yeah. is a tricky concept. I mean, read, right. read Nagel's right. book, the, the, Con the Possibility of Altruism, Thomas Nagel. It's a classic. So what does Marx do with evil? That might be a well. These are big. I, I, you know, these are big questions. I don't really have much to say about. But yeah, I see Justin wants to say. But General, did you want to comment uh, before? No, it's a, and before we get to discuss something else and to focus in on this question, because evil is a separate question. We want to talk about that <laughs> yeah. separately. It's um, because um, I took your comment to say. Generally speaking, like the left would be um, a more altruistic idea, and the right being more individualistic. It's um, it's that's. It, not, not necessarily. It's um because it's a, we live in a in a in a in a in a country that's been dominated by liberalism, um, but not traditional conservatism that arose in the, the 19th century. And traditional conservatism, um, which came out as a reaction to the French Revolution, um, had a very strong tendency towards corporatism, as it's called, which is the construction of traditional um, uh, societal units: the church, the family, um, the corporation, the trade union. And these uh, and 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 this uh, and this form of conservatism was actually very important in the formation of um, mainly continental uh, welfare states. And these types of welfare states had a very strong supportive. And if we could utilize the term in a very broad sense, altruistic, we could say a supportive notion. Um, and this is the vast majority of welfare states which exist on the continent. This is Germany, France, Italy, um, to a lesser degree Spain and Greece um, were formed out of this, as opposed to Anglo American welfare states or Scandinavian. Um, so it's a uh, it, it, in the United States we basically have you know we, we've we have a we've been we mainly have a consideration of liberalism and very varieties of liberalism, which takes the individual as the atomistic unit. Um, now the, I think something that's good to point out though with this type of consideration is that a consideration of of, of what is intrinsic to human nature we have to realize is that. Um, how we respond to one another is shaped by our, our, our existence in society, how we're able to actually support one another um, or act in support of our altruistic means is shaped by our, abil our the means that we can do so. Um, are other people in society actually members of the same group for ourselves? Can we be supportive? Or are they actually hostile to our existence? Um, and if, the reason I bring this up is that Marx is very interested in this problem. He's saying that if people Based, if people are separated from the means of production, they become in competition with one another for basically for labor slots. So do we see one another as being part of the same group? Do we see one another as being co-supportive? Or actually, are you hostile to my own existence? If you do better than I do, you can get a job and I won't. So it's in my own interest to, to out-compete you, to basically to, 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 be, uh, to treat you in a, in, a, in, a, in a detrimental way. So I think... It, as opposed to saying what's at the heart of human nature, is to say how do our social relationships shape how we can treat one another, um, and it, and that may be a more productive question. In this regard. It's um, that's just and that's only partially to look at this question. Um, I bet, yeah, go ahead. Uh, did you have a comment, General? Um, oh, be Betty first, and then David. I promise you, I know you. And we want to concretize it. Um, you, you look at what the left calls the workers. I've always contended that the workers are basically doing just what you said in this country. They had an opportunity to really have a union here at one point. And when Walter Ruta, is that his name? Yeah. Refused to unionize the South. He said, I'm not going to go there. Well, that was the end of the union movement. Because if you got one section, for whatever reason, that you don't unionize, then they'll just move all the factories there. And that's what they did. And that's what they're doing now and with the globalization. And the people yeah. felt it was a severe betrayal. Yeah. So the contradiction of race destroyed your units when you want to acknowledge it. That's right. And it goes back even further, so Betty. When you talk about self, uh, the psychosis that self, selfish people develop, be it racism, elitism, whatever you want to call it, what is it you want to call it today? Is it, it, it's, it, it deserves to be studied and analyzed. Yeah. You better analyze it right now because you're in trouble. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. David, yeah. Oh, okay. um, but in terms of the general theme of, uh, of the panel, um, the theory of the self, yeah. um, I, I see uh, uh, an ambiguity that I'd like all the panelists to clarify, you know, each of you to speak to, to this in, you, in your own way. Uh, Marx speaks of the self as the ensemble of social relations. Mm -hmm. He speaks of the self as inseparable from social relations. We, you're talking about that in many different contexts. You also point out that it goes all the way back to Aristotle, the social animal. You know, so there's, and then there's the philosophy of the Enlightenment, which begins to contradict that, begins to see the self in atomistic and separate, uh, isolated terms. Now, my question is: Is the Marxist view of what we should, what the Marxist view should be, let me say, as we go forward, one that returns? to a pre-enlightenment conception of the self as simply a part of the community? Or does the individuation of the enlightenment contribute to something that emerges uh, subsequently, uh, or could emerge subsequently? Uh, in other words, does our conception of the self as it evolves and as we think about what transcends capitalism, uh, socialist selfhood and, and, and personal relations, uh, essentially revert to a traditional uh, communal conception of the self, or does it bring that along but also incorporate some of the positive elements that come from the individuation of the enlightenment? What is the, what is the distinction between, uh, I guess, uh, an old Soviet social psychologist, Mort Porshnev, I believe his name is, wrote a book called From the We to the I to the We, but the new we is not the same as the old mm -hmm. one. It's like a spiral mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. uh, so do the members of the um, uh, panel uh, embrace that or contradict it or and elaborate it however you wish to do it? So, should we go? No, please. please. Go ahead. Justin? <laughs> so. Could you please give concrete examples? Mm -hmm. They come to these lectures. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here to be lecturer. I'm here to come up with lectures. <coughs> the um, uh, the uh, I, I took David's main thrust of his, of his comments to basically ask what type of conception of self um, should um, Marxism recommend. So it's a uh, this is this is the direction I heard you moving in. Is it basically a consideration towards a revitalization of a communal sense of self? It's um, would you agree, David? I just want to clarify. Well, rather, I'd like you should go ahead. Okay, sure. Uh, I, I could come back later. The um. The, uh, uh, the, the, how, how, th this question, basically to say, like, what is the position of self in society um, that, that perhaps Marx recommend, recommends or that, um, that Marxist thinkers have recommended since Marx's time? Um, I think it's rather, there's two things that Marx does, right? The one, on the one hand, Marx criticizes um, the, uh, the Anglo-American Enlightenment conception of the atomistic political individual. And he does it in, in various places. The most obvious one that is that is that is widely read is the introduction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The introduction yeah. of the Grundrisse, where he talks about the Robson Aids, which is the Robinson Crusoe <coughs> idea of the individual that which we're all Jean Rowe referred to. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, thank you. It's yeah. um, and then he parallels this with Aristotle's, you know, political animal. Um, so Marx is rather critical of this vision, and in general is rather critical and does not want to participate. At, at least explicitly in the social contract method, which is this mechanism of saying if we take individuals isolated from society and then we apply particular conditions such as scarcity or other people, what will they decide on? That's basically what the social contract mm -hmm. the, you know, theory has done. They don't care about individuals on their own on islands. They want to say once these individuals from all their islands seemingly come together, what would they decide on? Marx is, doesn't, is not interested in that. He doesn't want to participate in that, in that method. Um, so Marx basically what he does is he mainly tries to look at actual processes mm -hmm. or, or you know of of how societies have developed. And the most obvious position of this is primitive accumulation. Primitive accumulation is a critique of the theory of thrift. Right? People were not thrifty. They weren't able to save on their own to actually become capitalists. They basically disempowered and uh, rendered people propertyless. So on the one hand, Marx has a very strong criticism of this enlightenment trajectory of um, individual atomistic person. Now, on the other side of that, it's, um, is that 
the individual as the prime and irreducible candidate um, for interaction not only in society but for epistemological claims has had a very long history by the time Marx wrote. Um, a big shift occurred between ancient philosophy and scholastic philosophy into modern philosophy with basically the cogito, right? The Descartes saying, I think, and this basically establishes self, se, se, how do I understand? How does an individual understand as the basis for knowledge? So and part of this is how does the individual react? Um, I don't think Marx fully sh gets rid of this baggage. I don't think he fully gets rid of the, indiv the radical individual component of modern philosophy. It's um, because he still is very interested in basically talking about where do individuals exist in society? Can individuals find their own projects within society? Are they going to be able to maximize their ends in certain regards? Is this possible? And a lot of my comments, I think, were, were, were constructed and when I wrote this paper of saying that Marx still is very interested in saying, what is the limits of society and individual? Not as opposed to how do they, are they co-supportive in a lot of ways, but once we construct the proper set of social rules in order to prevent things like competition between individuals, then we can have a more supportive society. So Marx basically, even though he's critical of social, the social contract, he, in some regards, I find, steps into the same problem, where he's saying, OK, if we're hostile towards one another because we live in capitalism, how can we end that hostility? And once we end that hostility, we'll be able to basically pursue our own individual goals. We'll no longer be hostile to, 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 towards anyone else. Now, I, I think there's a limit. I think we could push Marx even farther. And partially, I think Russell's comments is, is trying to enliven this idea. Where can we look for else? Where else can we look in the world? What other types of ideas? that perhaps have not been completely structured by modern, modern, modern radical individualism can we pull on in order to do so. Um, so my answer is to say, how far can this market go? What's interesting about that, it's, um, and at the same time, there is a very strong residue of the individual as the prime candidate with, with, uh, that we're always going to be discussing with political philosophy and epistemology. So. Well, oh, are we out of time? Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, well. All right, anyway, let's, let's end officially, and if anybody wants to talk. But thank you all. That was really a so really very interesting discussion.